Okay, we live. Um, <clears throat> what's up? Uh, funny thing about this was uh, I actually recorded this twice over yesterday. So if you guys are following my Twitter, <coughs> I was trying to do a, I was trying to do a, um, you know, I was going to do this review and it would have released yesterday on Sun or Saturday the twentieth, but I actually had to record that twice because the first time my thing started, uh, my quarter like stopped recording at just like a minute so I'd literally been talking for like 30 minutes right I'd literally been talking for for 30 minutes and only a minute minute of that got recorded um, so then I wanted to do so then you know I had to record it again but then that time I got interrupted badly and uh, my editing skills were not good so I tried to do it twice and that was yesterday um, for some reason, I ended up sleeping at 5 p.m. and I just woke up, and it's 7 a.m. Sunday the 21st. So we're gonna do this now, cause I think we'll be we'll be all right. But yeah, this is gonna be my chapter review for 32. Ultimately, I thought it was a good, it was a solid, decent chapter. I don't know if I'd call it a good chapter. I may call it a good chapter, um, but it was definitely better than chapter 31. Uh, there are things I liked about it, things I hated about it, but you know. We're gonna start with the bad stuff. We'll, we'll 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 work our way from the bad stuff to the good stuff. Um. So yeah, let's just do that. Okay, so this is chapter thirty-two. Um, I don't want to say that this is necessarily a bad thing or that this was worse, but people in the Sadla army couldn't wear anything different than what Kaba was wearing. I mean, people did wear the same shit in Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z, whether it was between the Turtle School and Goku, Krillin, and Yamcha wearing the same Turtle School gi, the Crane School with Chaozu and Tien wearing the same green pants. I think, uh, yeah, Master Shen had the same green-yellow color scheme too. Frieza's Forces and Raditz and Nappa, they were wearing like the, you know, Ginyu and all of them, they were all wearing like that same uh, battle armor kind of like thing. Uh, the Kaioshin and the God's Instruction, they have the same clothing. So, it's not, that's why I was like saying, like, we've had that before, but I'm not gonna, so I would necessarily wouldn't say that it's a bad thing, but something about Kaba's clothes being replicated, something, it's just personal bias, I, I'm sure, but something about it just irks me. Um, another thing I didn't like was just that whole beginning part with the Universe Six Saiyans, because it's established that Kalifla is stronger than the Sadla army as a whole. Yet this bum-ass Universe 6 Saiyan tries to fight her, despite the fact that he knows that, because apparently she's underestimating them. Now keep in mind, I'm reading Viz's translation of this. Right. So anyway, she's underestimating them, and yeah. And uh, this bum then just goes try, tries to fight her, despite the fact that he just said that Caulifla was stronger than the whole army combined. Or at least Caulifla's gang as a whole is stronger than the whole army combined. So that, that was, I didn't like that either. And also for Saiyans who are allegedly more powerful than base form Saiyans from Universe 7, this was a very lame exchange. I'm not even gonna I'm not even gonna call it a fight because all Caulifla does is is take that bum's like arm and then flip him on some jujitsu shit. <clears throat> so that was lame. I didn't like the the fight in itself. Like I expected to see more from fucking you know like Universe 6 Saiyans and we're not getting that. And uh, remember Nappa? Like he did the little. Remember that he like did the whole thing on the planet. Like we've never seen, we haven't seen a feat like that from Universe Six Saiyans yet, so it's it's really lame. Um, I'm talking destructive capability. I'm not just talking like dodging or, or punching like stronger characters like Kafla against Super Saiyan God Goku or anything like that. I mean like actual destructive feats. And we haven't had that with the Universe Six Saiyans as far as I can remember. I mean Kaba, yeah. Um, Another part that really made me laugh, actually, was when the Saiyan pulled out the fucking gun. And this just goes to show, like, what I was saying. Universe 6 Saiyans using fucking guns. More powerful than Universe 7. Like, imagine imagine that universe, Imagine that guy using that on Nappa. Like, you think that's gonna work? Get the fuck out of here. Um, then Caulifla, for some reason, is another retard in this uh, arc. Uh, between both the manga and the anime. For some reason, she's one of those characters that doesn't care about her universe being destroyed. Now, this is obviously... I'm, I'm not talking about like her like caring about other people and being altruistic and being like a good person. I'm talking, about the, I'm talking about the fact that she doesn't care that her universe is going to be destroyed, which means that she's going to die. First of all, Caulifla doesn't even know that Universe 7 exists, in, as we see in this chapter. She doesn't know what Universe 7 is. So, 
by her own admission, she doesn't know what the fuck, she doesn't know that there is another, like, universe out there. She, all she thinks is that Universe 6, that's the only universe there ever was and there ever will be, until, you know, Kabat tells her otherwise. <clears throat> right? So, she doesn't, so, she doesn't care that her universe is going to be destroyed. Yet, she has no knowledge that there are other places that she can escape to, or anything like that. How can you, how, that, that, that literally does not make sense to me. For a character like Caulfield, how can you not care that your universe is going to be destroyed if that's the only place where you live? You know? You don't care? Like, you could, like, I, I don't understand this characterization, like, why people feel this way in Dragon Ball Super. You know? It makes no sense. It literally makes no sense. You, you don't have another place to go to. If your universe is going to be destroyed, you are going to die. You have to be incredibly depressed and suicidal to not care. You know? That's so that's why the thing like seventeen was dumb, and we're gonna talk about like Krillin like in a couple minutes. But actually, no, we're gonna talk about Krillin now. Krillin won't participate because he's too scared. So he finds out about Goku's lying, and you know Goku lying was obviously stupid for for obvious reasons. I mean, let's face it; it's not the first time Goku tried to lie. I mean, when he was trying to protect Trunks's uh, he was trying to protect Trunks's uh, identity and the fact that he would be born in the main timeline. Remember. Like, he, he didn't want to force a relationship and romance between Vegeta and Bulma. And so Piccolo took it upon himself to, like, not say anything about Trunks, but tell them about the androids, right? So, it's not the first time Goku's dealt with lying. And I've talked about Goku and Beerus lying for that matter, too, like, in the previous chapter. But it's just so dumb to me that like, Goku has to lie to these people who have fought Frieza, Cell, King Piccolo, Boo, dealt with Beerus, dealt with Golden Frieza, all this stuff, Zamasu. He has to lie to them about the universe being destroyed? Like, what's the point? It's a useless... Like, first of all, it makes the characters look stupid. And that's stupid. Not, not, not like Luffy being stupid for the sake... You know, not like other... Not Lu not necessarily Luffy, but like other characters like Luffy, Natsu, whoever. Like, because, like, stupidity is a charm of theirs. But this is, like, being stupid for the sake of, like, like trying to be smart. Like, there's, there's no, like, rhyme or reason to it. Because, first of all, Goku's not that dumb, right? Obviously. Yet people try to postulate him as, or, or, or they try to like uh, um, raise him up as like this incredibly dumb character right and he's not the smartest guy in the book but th the point is like Goku and Beerus trying to fabricate a lie when these people have dealt with world threatening and universe threatening enemies it's just so fucking <clears throat> dumb it makes no sense so Krillin and 18 find out about the fact that he's lying about the money right and then Krillin you know, once he says what he he says he's not going to participate because he's too scared. And Toyotaro, within this one panel, he's he's proven himself to completely miss the point of the character, right? For one, this is a comedy moment, right? Like it's it's supposed to be a it's supposed to be a funny moment, obviously, with Krillin saying that he's not gonna be he's not gonna participate because he's scared, right? It's supposed to be a comedy moment. But the reason why we need to judge it as a moment of bad writing is because it's also being taken seriously. Krillin is being serious about not participating in the tournament. And the moment in itself is comedic, but it's also serious because now they might lose a member on the team. So that's bad because Toyotaro completely misses the point of Krillin's character. Krillin's character, even though he's never been the strongest character in the series, the point of his character has always been the fact that he's been brave and that he's been able to stand up to people much stronger than him, like Nappa and the Cybermen, like uh, the Ginyu Force, like Dodorio like, uh, uh, Frieza, like, Cell, like, Android 17 and 18 to, to, to some extent, to, to Majin Buu before he turns him into chocolate, right? He, bravery has always been a strong suit of Krillin's. So if anything, Krillin's reaction should have been like, man, I'm scared, but I gotta do this, you know? It should have been something like that, not to say like, oh, I'm not going to participate because I'm too scared. You know, you're proving Goku's point. You're proving Goku's point that him lying, you know, which, I, which like I said, lying should not have, should not have happened to begin with, Right? But uh, you're proving his point that, yeah, you are too scared, so he's not going to tell you the truth. Then Goku tries, to, so after he finds out he's lying, Goku tries to convince Krillin by saying his heat and speed, his high heat, heat, height, and speed will help him in a fight. When neither his height nor his speed has ever been noteworthy skills of Krillin's in a fight, in any fight he's done, not with Chaozu, not with uh, uh, Piccolo in the 23rd World Tournament, not with the Cybermen, not with... Doria, uh, not with Goldo. Well, there is something about Goldo. We'll, we'll, I'll talk about that. Uh, 
but specifically height. Like, when has height ever mattered in a Dragon Ball or a Dragon Ball Z fight? I can never, I can't think of that. I can't, I mean, sure, Piccolo grows to be a giant and all this and, sh and all this and stuff, you know, but it's, but no one has ever had an advantage or ever been in a disadvantage or have it or ever had to use their height as a tactic in a fight, Sp especially in Dragon Ball Z. See, this is, this is what I'm talking about when I say Super's fighting sense, it's combat sense, it's power scaling sense, it's just fucking stupid. It's, it's, it's trash writing because size never matters it, do it doesn't matter when you're literally moving at the speed of light and being able to destroy planets with like this with two fucking fingers who cares whether you're like the size of an ant or like fucking huge as shit like uh, like like the entire solar system or whatever it doesn't fucking matter man it doesn't matter who cares if you're fucking small as shit who cares if you're seven feet as opposed to 511 what the fuck that's why, like, the whole thing about uh, Gohan saying Tapo's arms are huge. Like, get the fuck out of here. Like, in that one episode, that doesn't mean shit in a Dragon Ball Z fight. Does it? The, things like that don't mean anything. Shouldn't mean anything in a Dragon Ball fight. Then there's the whole thing about speed. So, yes, Krillin has been noted for, to be fast in the heat of the fight, in the heat of the moment, right? Because he has trained. But it's not like where it's Beerus, sorry, not Beerus, a Burger and Dispo where speed is a particular trait of his, where it's a particular combat trait of his, where like he uses speed as opposed to the Taioken or the Kienzan to help him win a fight. Now, against Guldo, he and Gohan, after he, Guldo uses his time skip, sorry, not uh, his, uh, his uh, time stop ability, excuse me, by holding his breath, Guldo is surprised at the fact that Krillin and Gohan are all the way over there, like in some other direction from when they, from where they once were, right? But that's actually acceptable because Krillin got faster by training. He's gotten faster by training. It's not that speed has necessarily been like so distinct of Krillin. Like, oh, Krillin, like the first thing you think about when Krillin fights isn't his speed. It's his Taioken and his Kienzan and that attack that he uses to, to kill the Cybermen, I guess. That's about, that, you know, like those are his distinct things, not him being fast or him being like physically strong, whatever. Those are things that you can always improve through training. So, like, why does it matter? Like, what, what, what is Krillin being small and supposedly fast going to do against Jiren? Or Hit? Or Cauliflower? Or Kefla? Or Kale? You know, like, characters like that. Or Kaba. You know, it, it's not going to mean anything. So, Goku trying to convince him, that, that was bullshit. Elder Kaioshin not knowing about Frieza, that was another thing. It's possible, and it would make sense, but it's still kind of unbelievable, considering how of Elder Kaioshin, he knows about Super Saiyan. Uh, he could hear from uh, he could hear things when he was trapped inside the Z sword back in the Buu, and the thing is like okay, I, I can buy the fact that in the five years since Buu has been killed, five plus years, you know Frieza maybe has seldom come up in a in in a discussion between uh, the gang when they get together or whatever. You know, it's not like I think El Kaijin has never come to Earth, right? And um and uh you know had dinner or or or, got, or partied with like the gang or you know, characters from Earth have gone to the Kaioshin world and seen Kabito Kai and him and, you know, talked and done whatever, right? So it's not like it's, 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 un, it's, it's impossible for him to not know who Frieza is, but it's still very odd considering everyone else does. You know, it's still very odd. Like, it's just like, huh, this guy doesn't know who Frieza is? How? Like, what? You know, even, even, uh, I mean, I, it makes sense how Kaioshin, Shin, as he's called, knows about Frieza, but Elder Kaioshin, it's, uh, and anyway, anyway, the point is, the point is that it's um, it's it, it's not necessarily bad writing. It is possible that and it, it would it in some sense it, sh it would be sensible that he doesn't know about Frieza, but it's still very unbelievable and awkward and odd considering everyone else does. Uh, Vegeta then has this line about how saying how Goku is always stupidly confident, and this got me for two reasons. Because one, Super for whatever reason is now trying to characterize Goku as this overly confident, cocky character, which he really for the most part never was. In the original Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z, yes, he was gullible and he was confident in himself, but he was never overconfident and arrogant, right? And yeah, he did take gambles, like how he did with Gohan going Super Saiyan 2, like how he did with Gotenks being the one to defeat Buu, right? But trying to Vegeta saying that Goku is always stupidly confident is just another uh, example of Super trying to mischaracterize Goku as cocky and overconfident. But the second thing is that Vegeta himself, he's one to talk considering that overconfidence and arrogance is Vegeta's shtick, at least from the Saiyan arc to the Androids arc, and now Super is apparently making him like that again, especially in the anime with him saying, 
I'm Vegeta Sama. I'm the prince of all Saiyans. I'm going to be number one. Goku is not stronger than me. Or Kakarot is not stronger than me. So, I I thought that was a I thought that was a poor choice of words chosen by Toyotar. I have no idea what he was trying to do with that. Um, another line of dialogue that I had a problem with was when Kaba was telling uh, Cauliflower after she achieved Super Saiyan that the Universe Seven Saiyans had a lot of trouble trying to getting accustomed to Super Saiyan. And this is not entirely false. I mean, Goku, within a year's time on Yarjat, learned to control it. Not that he necessarily needed the year, but within that time, he was able to control it for, and probably even more. Like, I don't believe Goku left Yarjat just as uh, just as soon as he learned how to control Super Saiyan, you know? Um, Trunks had to learn to master Super Saiyan when he was training with future Gohan uh, in the, uh, yeah, yeah, in the future. Uh, if you guys have read the manga, you guys would already know that Trunks was a Super Saiyan already. He didn't need future Gohan's death to make him a Super Saiyan, like how we saw in the TV special. In the manga, he was already a Super Saiyan when training with future Gohan in the manga, and he was training to get accustomed to it and become stronger. Goku had to teach Gohan how to control Super Saiyan when he went Super Saiyan in the Room of Spirit and Time. So, it's not, it's not, it's not entirely false to say that Saiyans had trouble, right, by getting accustomed to Super Saiyan, but a lot of trouble is definitely a stretch. Um, especially like if you're Goten and Trunks where Super Saiyan pla passes through the blood, right? Mine, you know, even with the whole SL shit, if you want to count that, they didn't have any trouble going Super Saiyan. So it was just a line of dialogue that I was like, a lot of trouble. They didn't have a lot of trouble going Super Saiyan. They had some trouble, but not a lot. And then uh, Frieza beating up on Goku. This was the worst part of the chapter to me. Um, not, not so much the Goku-Frieza interaction, but how Frieza was able to beat up on Goku that much. And the reasoning just was just like, Toyotaro, like Super in general is like, when it comes to fighting, the fighting sense in general, it's, it's just stupid. Frieza beat up on Goku that much, when, Go when Goku has obviously gotten much stronger since then by fighting Hit and Zamasu and mastering Super Saiyan Blue. Frieza beat up on Goku that much because of fucking image training fucking thinking not punching air or fighting each other not kicking not kicking air or practicing kicks no firing key blasts no no training under a hundred times plus uh earth's gravity no no training with uh, 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 uh weighted clothing none of that shit frieza got that strong by fucking image training image training Image training isn't a new technique. I mean, Goku and uh, Gohan and Krillin used image training when they were on the Capsule Core ship on the way to Namek. So it's not like image training is something new that is that is new to Super. But image training is how Frieza got that strong? So all people had to do in Dragon Ball Z according to Super, instead of punching or kicking or firing key blasts at each other for years on end within a training space, all they had to do was just sit down, meditate, and image train to get super powerful. That's all. Laughing my fucking ass off. Even if you take into even if you take into account what Revival of F said about how Frieza had great potential and he never trained, this is still massive bullshit. Image training is how Frieza got that strong. So now Frieza is, is as strong as like Master Super Saiyan Blue Goku and Vegeta. Are you are like are you for real? It's so stupid. Like I, this is one of the things where it's just like I can't see how people like Super with this. But that's the end of the bad stuff. Now we can actually talk about the pos more positive parts of the chapter. But before I, I get to that, I want to talk about what the chapter kept. Goku is lying, as in the other chapters, right? Like in chapter 31, Beerus has Goku lie about the universes because it will scare everyone, right? He thinks that... Beerus thinks that if Goku tells them the truth, it's going to scare them, despite the fact that they've already had their lives risked against Frieza, Cell, King Piccolo, and Boo, and Zamasu. For some, for some reason, it will scare them. It, 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 it's, it's just so stupid to think about that, right? Anyway. So Goku lying, that's kept. But now Krillin and 18 won't participate even though their universe is going to be destroyed. What the fuck kind of motivation is that? How can Krillin and 18 not want to participate when their lives are going to be endangered, where Marin is going to get fucking killed? That is so stupid. How... how the, you, you, don't, you don't want to fight in the tournament because... Well, first of all, Krillin, Krillin, you're too scared. 18, you have no money. So if there was no money, you'd be okay with Krillin and Marin dying, and 17 dying, and Goku dying, and, and, all, and all of them, right? I, I couldn't believe, like, I, I don't get this, I don't care, my whole universe is going to be destroyed. It's not that I don't get it, it's just straight shit writing. Period. Fucking period. 
It's so bad. Um, Frieza's revival is obviously a plot hole for obvious reasons, considering what Piccolo told Majin Vegeta back in the Boo arc before he died, right? And uh, they also kept Vegeta's lame retort of a halo looking good on Frieza, which that's that's like a that's like a god awful insult. You look good with that halo on. What the fuck? For someone who's apparently a cool character that people are really like, oh my god, he's so kakoi, he's so cool. I would I would expect like better insults. Anyway, now we'll talk. Well, now we'll talk about the good stuff. Um, Kale's introduction was actually she was actually tolerable in this chapter. Um, if you guys remember the uh, interview that Toriyama had with Oda, he said that all his females were strong-willed in some respect. They're all strong-willed women, and it's kind of true. All of them are strong-willed women. I can't think of a. I mean, maybe luncheon or base form is like the 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 the, the closest that I can think of, but. Even then, it's not like she was like Hinata or Kale in the anime where she was like, "What? Well, I'm so useless and all this stuff. So, Kale was actually someone of like, like, confidence. Like, she had some sort of like inner confidence to her character, which made me feel like I was reading like, an, I was seeing like another female character in a Toriyama series again. Um, she was actually, she was actually tolerable. And it's, I said it before in the past, like, that sort of character archetype with like Hinata and Kale. That shy archetype is personally something I don't like, and I and as as was proven, it did, sh Kale did not fit at all in Super. But there's also the addition of when you read manga as opposed to watching anime, you don't have to listen to a voice, and Kale's voice was irritating as fuck to listen to. Listen, the girl the girl who voices her is the same one who voiced CC in Code Geass. So the voice actor is not a bad voice actress, right? She's not a boy. She's not a bad voice actress, but Kale's voice is still annoying as fuck to listen to. She's like, "What does she want? What does she? I'm so useless!" And then she goes berserk for him, and then goes like, "Kakaroto, Kakaroto, Son Goku, or no, no, not Kakarot, Son Goku, and like all this." And then she's like, "Why did you hurt Anisan and like cauliflower?" Whenever she's like screaming or like yelling like that. Or like being just like fucking Mika shit. The voice is so irritating and grating to listen to. So there's that's actually that's actually an advantage of reading Kale in the manga because you don't have to listen to her voice. So that so so Kale was actually was actually more tolerable. So I like that. Um, the way Goku described his loss to Tapa was good. I've always liked when uh, Goku could admit that people were like much stronger than him, even in the original manga. Like when he said that Kro when Cell would beat the hell out of him, or when he was like, "Go to like I can't beat Boo as I am right now," you know, like st stuff like that. Like it it shows his humility as a character, or like his openness and his truthfulness as a character. And so the way that he was describing his loss to Tapa to Vegeta was good. I thought that was like very like level headed of him to do that. Frieza meeting Goku, that was also great, because in the anime, like, in the anime, like, the coloring and all that stuff was good, but when Frieza sees Goku in hell in the anime, he's already smiling, and he's, like, he's, like, interested. He's, like, he's, like, smiling. He's not mad at all that Goku is there. In the manga, he actually shows irritation at first that Goku is there, and then Goku offers to revive him, and then the way that Frieza says, like, what are you up to? That whole situation to me was really good in the manga, right? That whole situation to me was good in the manga. And uh, I liked it too in the anime, but it was still a little, just a little too strange for me to watch in the anime. But Frieza's reaction to Goku was great here. Uh, Vegeta, but the best part, the best part of the chapter was Vegeta getting ready and meeting the team. That was fantastic. Well, not fantastic. I mean, fantastic is like too big of a, of a word to use, but it was, it was the best part of the chapter. I was like... Just seeing Vegeta get up, put on his clothes, no homo, and then meet the team saying, like, Gohan, you look sharp, long time no C-17, stuff like that. That's what Vegeta should have been like after the Boo arc. And obviously, if you watch the anime, he's he's back to Android's arc Vegeta, where he's like, fuck everyone, especially fuck Goku, I'm number one. Which is inconsistent with his character for obvious reasons. After Boo, that is. But um, Vegeta getting ready here and actually being like somewhat like friendly with the team and, and the other people, that was great. That was good. So that was the best part of the chapter for me, for sure. I loved seeing that. And yeah, that's pretty much the chapter. Not a bad chapter. Um, I don't know if I'd... Uh, sure, why not? I'd, I'll, I'll call it a good chapter. Why not? Um, and I enjoyed it.
now I'm off to watch the Dragon Ball Super episode, what is it, 123, and um, I'll probably put out my review for that later today. Uh, I'll probably be late at night, but uh, thank you guys for watching. I'll see you guys when I see you. Bye-bye.